Welcome to the Plaid Sheep Oracle. This is an all signs reading for the full moon in Aquarius, occurring on August 19th at 2.26 Eastern Time, that's U.S. Eastern Time, 2.26 p.m. And there are all kinds of things happening at the same time. It is intense, crowded, uh, filled with signs kind of the long game, the long arc. I think that I'm going to put the image of the chart as the thumbnail for this reading. Um, I have a few added points than you usually see, three, three asteroids to add. You may, if you follow astrology, you may already know that this full moon is going to be almost exactly square Uranus. Uh, that Mercury will be conjunct the Sun. Also conjunct the Sun is Vesta, planet of devotion, of the flame that you keep burning. Uh, then there's another square happening. Uh, Jupiter at the top point in Gemini, and then Venus in Virgo and Saturn in Pisces. Now they're sort of what I think of as their tightest moment when Venus exactly opposes Saturn will be in the wee hours of Monday morning. Um, and then the Jupiter square to Saturn will be later in the day. Then for my purposes, there's actually a, th uh, a third grand cross, or, or um, T-square rather, uh, which is Ceres, the asteroid Ceres. She's uh, a mother goddess, a goddess of nature and abundance. She's Proserpina's mother. She's Demeter. And she is squaring the nodes almost exactly from Capricorn. And then another thing that's happening is that there is a kind of grand cross. A grand cross is when there are four planets in a square arrangement with Pallas Athene. Now it's not, there's a few degrees of orb, but she is opposing Uranus. So she is in Scorpio at about, I think she's at 22 or 20, 23 and change of Scorpio. And Uranus is at 27 of Taurus. So there is energy coming from the fixed signs, the mutable signs, and the cardinal signs. This is the opening square of Jupiter and Saturn. They met at zero Aquarius where Pluto is sitting at the moment on the solstice in 2020. Um, there was also a Mercury Kazimi right before that conjunction as there is now before this full moon and this square. In fact, going forward through uh, the Jupiter opposition and then the closing square before the next conjunction to Saturn. There is more Mercury involvement. So it's important not to look at things in a vacuum. But we can explore this particular moment. Uh, an interesting thing for me is that these crystals wanted to be here. Uh, there's this selenite piece, uh, rose quartz, and then this agate that actually is meant to have a drop of water inside it. And that, of course, feels very Aquarius, the water bearer.
and selenite, I don't, um, I don't know if it's sort of an official correspondence, but it does have a sort of lunar feel to me. And then because it's this shape, there is this sense of conjunction and also, you know, sort of the straight line between two points. And then there's all the, right, the complexity of all the individual lines that we can see in selenite and its iridescence. Um, for those of you who are sand watchers, I tell you now that there is a leaf blower man, <laughs> not a lawnmower, but a leaf blower happening. I don't know if you can hear it. It might be dulled enough and I'm going to run the video through a a program to get rid of some of the background noise. Um, but it's interesting. <laughs> it should be happening now. And then, of course, the rose quartz is love. Uh, a, a stone, I think, certainly of Venus and of the heart chakra. Uh, Venus actually is making aspects to almost everything in the next two weeks. Uh, she, she opposes Saturn, she squares Jupiter, she squares Mars, she trines Uranus, and then she trines Pluto. Oh, and uh, she opposes Chiron. All before the end of August. So, to begin, the kind of group energy. And there is a sense... So you will see epitomized in the final deck of opposing energies. So at the top here we have stability. And this feels like a suggestion, <laughs> advice, um, something to focus on in the next weeks, or maybe even in the next months. this stability, this, um, and she's not only stable, she's, you know, at peace. She is, you know, it isn't as even, you know, she's, you know, really holding on to something tightly. She, her stability is relaxed. And the bottom of the deck, transmutation. So that may be what is happening. And I feel in this moment, <laughs> this urge to just stop and wait until the leaf blower man is finished. But I also feel like that, that's, that this is kind of part of the point, that we're going to have this, <laughs> this going on, and then our task is to remain at peace even through, you know, whatever leaf blower thing is going on. The next card, beautifully, is Blessing. This story, um, the Gunakadeit, hopefully I've said that well, of a fish that grows and grows and grows. Now, interestingly here, the card underneath is this Kraken with mystery. And then the bottom of the deck is the Morgan with sovereignty. Now I'm really looking forward to seeing which cards come out from this deep, dark, dangerous oracle. And then we have the Dryad of Kingship. Also a sense of stability, of, of right, keeping hold of what is important of the tree of family and friends, I would say both kith and kin. 
remembering what really matters when there may be chaotic energies and you're you know sort of tempted to run over here or run over there or um, you know get spun out or overwhelmed to come back come back to this um, this is emphasized here with this home away of the house on the sea and then by the bottom of the deck which is the five of wands and this always has a little bit of a mob like feeling to me in this card you know sort of the mob approaching Frankenstein's castle or Dracula's castle um, someone who has you know lost their head they've you know flames are just shooting out um, that makes me think of that scene from Clue, if you've seen that movie, with Mrs. White, where she, she talks about flames surrounding her head. She's so enraged. So this, right, there may be this happening. And when it is, we want to remember this. The leaf blower, blessedly, has moved on. And then we have the Eight of Materials. And this seems, you know, certainly about doing work that, that pleases us, that is part of our gift, that is entrancing to us. But there is also, with this card, particularly the suggestion of, of juggling, that there may be many things happening. that we may need to do a little bit of juggling. And, you know, underneath that is this five of pentacles. And I want to say that, right, that something is incoming. You know, and it may be that you've been living in some sort of, and also actually below that, the five of emotions. That maybe you've been living in some sort of lack. Uh, of, of something, it could be anything, of, of companionship, of work, of money, of inspiration. And now it is just going to come in. A card that has been associated with this transit for me repeatedly over the last days in private readings and personal readings is the Eight of Wands. And when the Eight of Wands comes in, you might need the Eight of Materials and, in fact, the Four of Materials, which sits at the bottom. And she comes through in many different ways, but today she's coming through as self-care. Right? Smell the roses. Um, you know, rub the roses on your body. Um, you know, immerse yourself in anything that is rejuvenating anything that feeds you, anything that nourishes you, surround yourself with whatever these roses are for you. And then this moon deck, you know, this moon deck is really funny. I find it, you know, in some ways it's sort of simplistic and, um, a little bit reductionist in some ways, but I, if I ignore the guidebook, <laughs> often very interesting things come through. And because this is a full moon reading, I sort of think that these moon cards coming out are a way to see this moon for you personally as we get to each individual sign. And here for all of us is this moon stag. He's so great. I love this card. And it is actually a super moon. Um, if you've been out seeing her as she grows, you will see, especially if you go when she's either rising or setting, when she's closer to the horizon, she will look especially big. And perhaps golden. Um, this first kind of of the hardest moons. And, I, you know, it's interesting, I, I think about that, right, this what we call harvest season. But it's actually only the harvest of a specific set of things. 
right? It's grains, particularly, right? Those things which are going to keep and sustain us through the winter. Because we've been harvesting things all summer, right? Even from April. We've been harvesting lettuce and asparagus and herbs and um, peaches and cherries and corn. You know, has been around in my farmer's market through since mid-July or even a little earlier. So this idea of the harvest season is really kind of, right, it's those things that we collect that can be stored that are going to keep us alive through the winter. Now, most of us in the modern world certainly don't have this issue. We can go to the grocery store and buy strawberries in January if we feel like it. But maybe there is something that we can harvest now. And, and I know this is a North, your Northern Hemisphere centered thing. But maybe there is something we can harvest now. I've often thought about sort of harvesting sunshine, finding a way to, you know, sort of bottle it or keep it, to hold on to it, so that in January when the sun, you know, is very low on the horizon, um, you know, although it's beautiful in its own way, I miss the sharp light, the, the, you know, the direct light of summer, to have it, right, to have it internally. Uh, you can think about that as, as having vitamin D for yourself by being out in the sun a lot through the summer. So this storing up of vitality for the season to come. And if you do live in the Southern Hemisphere, maybe you want to store up some of the chill. Find a way to store up coolness and crispness before the summer comes and it gets hot. The bottom of the deck is kind of the reverse with the black moon. Right, again, this sense of this and that. The final cards, this is a new deck for me. I'm just getting to know it. And what we have here is the Keeper of Wonder. And this is calling through a bit to this card. Um, right, that one of the things that may nourish us is a sense of wonder and curiosity. You know, in other words, don't panic. <laughs> Even if it feels very intense. And then on the bottom of the deck, oh, actually, look at that. The cards, they're new and they're very shiny and they've been sticking together. And the card that I first saw on the bottom is contradiction. <laughs> but in fact, it is sticking to the real card at the bottom of the deck which is peace. Oh, <laughs> the contradiction, the contradiction of a possible peace within the chaos, the eye of the storm. Um, the fourth stone that came out is not actually a stone, it's amber, right? Fossilized resin. Uh, that kind of wants to be held. It is, uh, it's a personal stone to me. And a, and a grounding energy. All right, well, let's begin. I've been going on now for almost 20 minutes about this. Um, so Aries. Wisdom. Oh, the fetch with mirror. What we see. Temperance. 
the Muse of Emotions, the Wheel, ah, and the last quarter, and I'm going to leave this last card for the end. Well, this, <laughs> this certainly seems like self-understanding. And that there may be that you may have some sort of epiphany around that. Um, we have wisdom and here um, I see you as this person and you've been contemplating, thinking, and what you don't see is this owl coming behind you. And owls do actually fly silently. That's part of their repertoire skills to be silent. So you don't know the owl's coming. You haven't heard any flapping of wings. It's just drifting, coasting in behind you and is gonna land on your head. And maybe, now that I've said that, maybe there's something about Pallas Athene. Uh, the owl is Athena's bird. Um, Pallas is in Scorpio, which is related to you, also guided by Mars. You could have a look where your palace is. Uh, she is about strategy and intellectual problem solving, uh, wisdom, courage. And I think also to some extent, um, you know, the right word isn't exactly spontaneity. It's um, it's the, the intuition that I associate with fire signs of just knowing and acting instantly. As Athena herself showed up fully formed out of Zeus's head. Right? It's like she was an inspiration, a kind of clear cognizant understanding. And then the fetch, the mirror. Um, the illusion, have you been looking at an illusion when you see yourself or maybe when you see a situation? Right, with what we see, what do you see? And then this particular temperance card who always, who always seems as if she's just had an epiphany. It's just, oh my God, I see it now. I can't believe it took me so long. It's right there in front of my face. And then the muse of emotions seems like integration of whatever this realization is. And that seems to here to be the case with the wheel as well that there's a kind of um, an understanding, an integration, a, a, a bringing it together. Um, the wheel calls to mind the fates who uh, weave, weave on, at the loom of fate. So, so something about bringing things together bringing understanding together. And then the last quarter, the completion of something, uh, the final pieces being put together. You know, there is this uh, astrological concept, and I can't remember the name of the man who developed it. If I remember to, I will find it and stick it in the description box. But the idea is that there is a kind of moon cycle that is beyond the new moon to full moon to new moon within a month. So it's a nine month at a time thing. 
So you have a new moon at, say, 10 degrees of Cancer. Nine months later, there is going to be a first quarter moon that's about that same 10 degrees. It might be as much as 12 or down to 8, and it will be, you know, kind of at around the same day. So that's like the opening nine months later. And then nine months after that, there's a full moon that is again in that same space of a few degrees and day of the month. And that's kind of the culmination. And then there's a last quarter, nine months after that, that is a kind of completion. Now, sometimes, of course, things in our lives take much longer than that. But there may be things in your life that, that kind of complete an arc in those 27 months from new moon to last quarter. I mean, and it's kind of actually, um, you know, even slightly beyond that until the next um, new moon. But really this completion within, you know, 27 months or so. So you might, that might be a thing for you, Aries, since I'm going on about it. Um, you may want to look what happened at the new moon in Aquarius nine months ago. Is there some, something that is, or actually uh, at the new moon in Aquarius 18 months ago, because we're at the full moon. So nine months ago to the first quarter in Aquarius at about 27 Aquarius, and then nine months before that, to the new moon in Aquarius. So mm, mid-February of um, 2023. Is there something for you that is an arc around that? That may now be coming into um, a kind of peak and that will complete in some way nine months from now when we get a last quarter in Aquarius. Last card. Oh, <laughs> risk, Aries. But look at this, this red fiery card. Right? I want to say that the owl landed on your head. You saw something, you realized something, you had an epiphany. You did those, right? You did some integration. Maybe, maybe that's what's happening through this next nine months is some deep integration. And then there's this butterfly and that you, I, Aries, you love risk. Risk is your bread and butter. To be the first. To go in where both angels and fools fear to tread. And that there's going to be some sort of crowning of something, maybe of you, or a crowning event on something, right? Something that's the cherry on the Sunday. I think it's exciting, Aquarius. Aquarius, Aries, don't panic. <laughs> that's the key, is to, to keep your cool. To remember who you are. Taurus. Oh, transformation. Certainly a theme going on, clearly. Oh, Sphinx with gratification. Oh, the surprise date. 
That's exciting. And we have the Nine of Emotions, Nine of Cups, Two of Materials, Oh, and the Ace of Emotions. Oh, and there's the Night Owl. Well, Taurus. This feels like really coming into your own and being really being able to receive something that you've been wanting, desiring. Right, she's here, and it is the transformation, but there's also this pearl and this Venus imagery of Venus on the half shell. And she is your guide, Taurus. Your patron. There's something about that, right? The patron. The wealthy patron that is going to show up for you in some way. I don't know what that means, Taurus, but it wants to come out. And I, this seems like a wealthy patron, right? This Egyptian queen and her fabulous cat, possibly named Bast, Bastet. This, this mystery, right? the Sphinx who asks questions. And now you know the answers, Taurus. This full moon that is squaring your sign, that is squaring Uranus and Aquarius moon, this is the last opportunity, I think. for the Aquarius moon to square Uranus. I'm not absolutely certain about that, but it may be true since it's coming through. And Uranus has been moving through your sign since fully since 2019. We'll be there really still until 2026. There's still some time, but Something, something has changed for you. There is a transformation that you've gone through of receiving, particularly, of being able to accept. The surprise date that's showing up. I, it, it may be, you know, there is this nine of emotions, which, you know, has the genie's lamp. So this fulfillment of a wish. But there is something that's going to be a surprise. I don't know if it's going to come from left field. If there's going to be something about it that is completely unexpected. If it's going to come with something that is unexpected. But there's something that's a surprise. Even if you've been wishing for it. And with this two of materials, this kind of joyous two of pentacles, there is not a sense of difficulty, of struggle, of chaos in the background as you're struggling to balance parts of your life. This is excitement. This is joyousness. This is finding this fun. Right? You've been living in lack and suddenly suddenly it's changed. You know, suddenly have, you have these giant roses and you are not overwhelmed at all. You are completely at home handling these giant roses. And completely at home with 
the emotional energy that's going to come with that. With, with joy, with the overflowingness of things that in the past might have left you, that might have left you feeling overwhelmed, that might have caused you to turn yourself off in some way, uh, to attract something into your sphere that would, you know, rebalance this to the lack. You're going to be so comfortable, Taurus. So comfortable with richness. And with this night owl, the owl is showing up again. Um, the owl came out in Aries reading. And Pallas, Pallas Athene is opposite you in Scorpio. Uh, the owl is Athena's bird. Wisdom. So there is a wisdom in this too. And with her sitting opposite there, opposite Uranus, she provides strategic thinking. She is a stabilizing element that may assist you in this, right? Whatever Uranus has planned, whatever this surprise is, whatever this Uranian energy brings, this pal palace stability is across from you, ready to serve. And last card. <laughs> Grounding, Taurus. <laughs> well, that is easy for you. But what's coming through also here, not so much the grounding, but all of these mushrooms. We Here in, where I live, we had a whole bunch of rain last week. And mushrooms sprouted all over the place, as they do after the rain. There was a great abundance of really large mushrooms all over the place. You know, it was as if they sprang up fully formed, almost. So that's another element. Great abundance, lots of stuff. A cornucopia filled and spilling out everywhere, Taurus. And your job with this grounding is to receive. You may... Um, you may be learning, maybe you have been learning up until this point, some practices for moving and circulating energy through your body so that when wonderful, fabulous things come and rush at you, you don't uh, have a panicked moment or a shutting down moment. You allow them to circulate. So you, whatever you've been doing, Taurus, well done. The, the abundance, the, this patron is coming for you. Gemini. The enchanted fern grotto with refuge. Scylla with resilience. Kindred, the two of inspiration, justice, the night of materials, ah, and the blue moon. Gemini, have you been feeling a little, a little under siege? Maybe a little bit of overwhelm, a little bit of, um, 
maybe choice overwhelm or not knowing which way to go. Uh, Scylla is part of two, two things. Um, in, in the Odyssey, Odysseus has to sail between Scylla and Charybdis, and Charybdis is this giant whirlpool that could suck the ship in. And then Scylla is a somebody who was turned into a monster and is now, you know, sort of filled with rage and um, attacks people. Now, the advice that Odysseus is given is that he should sail closer to Scylla because then he might just lose a few men, but he won't get his whole ship sucked down the whirlpool. And that is what he does. But Scylla um, you know, she's somebody who's had a very, she's had a hard time. Um, she, you know, she kind of gets turned into a monster, as happens in these Greek stories, through no fault of her own, really. Uh, later, Hercules kills her, and then she's brought back to life, which is why she has this resilience thing going on here. But it may be that you've, right, that you've felt a little bit Right, maybe under siege, because there is also this refuge. And I can understand it, Gemini. You've had Jupiter crossing through your space. Uh, he met with Mars yesterday, August 14th. He is involved in this T-square with Saturn and Venus, Jupiter, in your sign. So there is a lot of energy, a lot of stuff, a lot of pressure, perhaps, going on. And the advice here seems to be, for one thing, to lean into friends and family. To lean into your people, Gemini. Also, uh, you know, guides in your own fellowship, if you speak to them. Source, God, angels. Um, you know, the trees that grow around you. All your kith and kin. To not, not attempt to shoulder everything yourself. And then with the two of inspiration to also lean into curiosity. To get curious, to let, um, right, to let curiosity sort of turn your head a little bit. You know, if you've been staring into the headlights or what feel like headlights coming at you. To, to allow yourself to turn a little bit, right? To turn away from this kind of deep red sky that may feel very ominous. And to let your curiosity take you somewhere. Because um, it's not entirely a it's not just to distract yourself, I would say, because what comes next is justice. And this justice that has this, right, this sense of, um, of something rising out, of, of clarity, of an epiphany, of a rising out of shadow, uh, even of a rebirth, perhaps. And that if you allow your curiosity to lead, you can kind of be in this space. Of, you know, maybe seeing things more clearly, not, not being blinded by the headlights or what seems perhaps like an oncoming train in the tunnel. And then we get 
the uh, Knight of Materials, the Knight of Pentacles. And I really enjoyed this particular knight because he's not so slow, he's not really plotting, he's cantering, uh, he's covered in flowers. And he represents Virgo as well, who, like you, is led by Mercury. So there may be something about leaning into Virgo. Uh, Mercury is retrograde, moving retrograde right now. And he is, I think that he's moved back into Leo now, but he was in Virgo. That's where he began his retrograde and where he will finish when he finally exits the shadow space, uh, I think on September 12th. So there is, there is some wisdom, some advice, some stability, some assistance, some help that you can receive from Virgo energy. And maybe with this kindred, maybe there's a specific Virgo. Maybe you know someone who has strong Virgo energy, whether it's Sun or Venus or Mercury or North Node or whatever. Maybe they have a Virgo stellium. who may be there really, really as somebody to lean on, to seek advice from, to, um, to spend time with, right? Just to sit in their energy that may feel so comforting. You may really, you know, uh, feel comfortable with Virgo. Because while it is grounding and Gemini doesn't really want to be grounded, it's a familiar grounding with Mercury at its core. You know, these moon cards, if you watched the intro, you will know that I've been thinking of them as each sort of each signs moon. What is the moon signature of this moon? And yours is the blue moon which is something rare, something that doesn't happen all the time. So that there are possibilities for you, Gemini, in this space that maybe you haven't considered. And maybe it's this curiosity that there is something wanting, right? Wanting you to turn your head to look, look here. Gemini. And maybe there is, maybe that, I don't know, maybe there's something Virgo-ish, uh, something having to do with your body or uh, with acts of service or with nature even. Um, Venus is moving through Virgo at the moment, opposing Saturn, right? This is part of this square. So leaning perhaps into Venus energy. Maybe something you love that you haven't focused on. Uh, something that seemed, you know, irrelevant at the moment. Something you put aside that is calling you. Something you haven't touched in a long time. And last card. Oh. That's interesting. Discretion. But you know, I want to say this is not discretion in the sense that we often think of it where you have discretion, right? You don't give away someone's secrets, right? If somebody shares something with you in confidence, you are discreet. You don't share it with everybody. This discretion, as in having discretion around choices, right? Not, not choosing everything, Gemini, even though that may be your temptation to just let all the information come in, but to have real discretion, discernment 
around what you allow into your presence at the moment. And that is for sure a Virgo trait. Virgo is particular. So use discretion, Gemini, in communication, in what you allow into your presence, into your energy at the moment. Oh, Gemini. Hang in there. <laughs> Cancer. Spirit Guardian of Spring, activation. I feel like, did that come out for you in the last All Signs? I don't know, I'll have to go look. Oh, Sharon, reciprocity. Lucidity. The Ten of Voices. The sun and the high priestess and moon goddess. So appropriate, <laughs> Cancer. <laughs> well, you are clearly being activated in some way, Cancer. I mean, not only activation, but I see, you know, Sharon was the boatman who would ferry souls across the river Styx, and it's why we put coins with the dead. I mean, you put coins on the eyes because it helps keep the eyes closed if they were open when someone died, but also it's two coins to pay the ferryman. But here he's coming across, not to ferry you across the river Styx, but to take you somewhere. Really cool. <laughs> you know, I kind of, I have this whole story that's starting to show up in my head about how you, you received some sort of message. You receive you know, either it's a literal message, like a, a, you know, sort of a Harry Potter letter that came to you. Um, you know, I have this story of, you know, you receiving a beautiful, you know, cream envelope with a intricate wax seal, and you open it up, and it directs you to go to a specific place on a specific day and time, and when you get there, Sharon is there, and he's going to take you somewhere. You get in the boat. Um, there are shades here with the High Priestess of being taken, you know, to Avalon. Um, to uh, right with with this right with this dance. And I want to say, if you are a woman, that you are, right, that there's something about women's mysteries. Um, and if you're a man, that it's about man's mysteries. But that there is, that there is ritual, there is, you know, perhaps there is dance, there is uh, some sort of ceremony, something that, right, that is part of this activation process. And whatever it is, is going to be intense. It's going to feel, there's going to be feels of all kinds. It's going to be intense. There may be physical uh, repercussions. Um, fatigue. Uh, insomnia, headaches, um, excess energy even, perhaps. You may feel really energized, uh, wired. 
You know, and it's interesting because there's actually nothing much happening technically, not in the big sense in Cancer. There's no planets in Cancer. Uh, there are some asteroids floating around in there, but um, none of the major planets are moving through your sign. But it is a full moon and you are guided by the moon. And Ceres sits opposite you squaring the nodes and Cancer by itself is squaring the nodes. And it makes me think of, of the mysteries of Eleusis, if I'm saying that correctly, which had to do with Persephone and Demeter and Hades, or Pluto, who is, very shortly, on September 4th, I think, moving back into Capricorn across the way from you for just, like, two and a half months, till November 19th. And then he moves back into Aquarius and is gone, and will not be back with you for more than 200 years or opposite you. Um, I don't know when he enters Cancer. It's a long time away, a hundred and something years away. So something, something about these sacred mysteries of death and rebirth. Uh, I don't know if I've talked about a sort of retelling of Persephone uh, that I encountered with, with somebody uh, whose teachings I've read about this idea that Persephone, right, she's, she's swept up by Hades in his chariot and he takes her down there and she wanders around. She's, you know, upset and sad and um, she doesn't know what to do. And then, you know, because she's just so hungry, she eats some pomegranate seeds. And in the original story, this means she's bound to the underworld. So she has to spend half her year down there. But in this retelling, when she eats the seeds, she is awakened. It's an awakening. It is um, a shadow integration. It's an understanding of the underworld and the light and that these two things combine in the self. And that she's not just this little goddess of spring, she is queen of the underworld. She is consort to Hades, to Pluto. She is powerful. She has knowledge and understanding of birth and death. Um, of Scorpio, of Taurus. where a lot of this moon action is sort of happening. So it is intense, but it is also clarifying. It is the ability to see clearly, right? To see as the high priestess. and as the moon goddess. Right? To be in touch with the moon as you are moon led. The moon is your guide. No matter, you know, what your cancer placement is, the moon plays um, an important part. And we have, I mean, we have both the sun and the moon, the high priestess is associated with the moon. So this full moon hmm. 
keeper of opportunity. <laughs> Not surprised at all, Cancer. This is an opportunity for you to really embrace this activation. To become the high priestess or priest. To, uh, right, to flower. Also to be able to, right, to channel the intensity. Because this won't be the last intense moment. There will be more. Oh, cancer. You're going to be the person to know. I don't know. We'll see what happens in your next longer reading and whether this comes up. I'm going to move for just a second to plug the phone into power. I'm sorry, Leo. Spirit guardian of winter. Cerberus. Fledgling. All oh, the lovers. Page of Inspiration. Oh, interesting. Queen of Emotions. Oh, and the Sky God. Oh. Leo. You have some sort of connection to Cancer. I don't know what it is. I don't know if you know one. I don't know if many of you who have Leo placements also have Cancer placements. I don't know what the deal is, but this there's Leo Cancer connection has been going on in the readings for a while now. I don't know what it is. But so this retreat, you are being invited out, Leo. If you've been, right, if you've been in your bubble, if you've been on retreat, you are being invited out. Now, Cancer, and you may want to go watch that if you, if you didn't. Cancer received some sort of activation, a letter, a message, uh, you know, to, to go to an appointed place where they met Sharon, the boatman of the River Styx, to take them to this place of activation of ritual of mysteries you are being hailed by Cerberus who is right the guardian of the underworld knocking on the door And it may feel, with this fledgling, it may feel a little rough. I mean, right, they're a little serious. They could look, they could look scary. Cerberus, dog with three heads, showing up at the door. It's time to go, Leo, gotta go.
Um, and so it may feel like falling, you know, they've made you leave the house without any pocket handkerchiefs. You are, you're being rushed. But you're being rushed to some sort of meeting. And I don't know, this could be a jet, this could actually be a place. This may all be completely literal <laughs> or entirely symbolic. But there is something, some place, some meeting. And then the page of inspiration. And where whatever happens at this meeting, and this is not, I want to say that you're not meeting, you're not actually meeting a lover, I don't think. This, I think this meeting is temporary. That at this meeting, you're going to receive some sort of information. A download. Perhaps if this meeting is uh, spiritual, uh, maybe some sort of uh, creative inspiration is going to hit you. Uh, maybe you're going to meet up with someone whose work you've admired. And this is going to inspire you. but you become this queen of emotions, right? You go from being this poor fledgling, falling through the air, shoved out of the nest, feel like you're falling down a hole, to this queen of emotions. She's my favorite queen of cups, rising out of the deep to just surprise this person. Then we have this sky god card and the cancer had the moon goddess. So I don't know, maybe this inspirational person has cancer energy. Maybe this Cerberus, if it's a person, has cancer energy. Maybe there's some sort of transit you're having to the cancer space of your chart. Because this is, right, the queen of emotions, the queen of cups is associated with cancer. Uh, there is this sense of counterpart energy. Sky god and moon goddess. And you're kind of two sides. The, the cancer's thing was more... Um, in the nature, right, of this high priestess, uh, you know, receiving oracular vision, receiving download, receiving wisdom. And you are more about acting on that with this page of inspiration and this, you know, queen of emotions who's rising out and this god masculine energy. So I don't know what it is. Leo. And interestingly, I was not inspired at any point in the Cancer reading to talk about Leo. So I don't know how that is, that, that there's something about that it's more important for you to know that this is happening, maybe because you are the active portion of things. I mean, maybe, maybe you both show up here and meet a third person. Because there do seem to be, right, there's these, you know, or even a fourth, there seems to be two people down here and two people here. So there's kind of a meeting of a bunch of people happening.
But whatever it is, you are, there is right, this activation happening. Oh, and your final card. Priorities. Oh, Leo. Mm -hmm. Well, so maybe whatever this is, Right, because there's actually this, right, there's a kind of color thing going on. These two cards have colors in common, this gold, green, white thing happening. Maybe you've been wrapped up in something and you need to reconsider your priorities when Cerberus shows up at the door. Maybe there is some, some outward thing, some conjoining other people, some stepping out into the world aspect. Um, Mercury and Vesta conjoin the sun at this full moon. So something that needs to be spoken aloud you know, and this card has a grasshopper, which in a different card is the leap in a different deck. It's taking the leap, Leo. So there's some, right? There's an activation. There is you, you taking action, Leo, in some way. Cryptic, I know. I'm sort of hoping that all of these things become enlarged as we go forward uh, in the next set of readings. I'm about halfway. I've got five signs left in the, the sort of larger readings. Um, and then we begin again. So maybe, you know, sort of a monthish from now, we'll see when the, when the next Leo reading appears wants to be done. And then we will see, perhaps, hopefully there will be more information, Leo. All right, continuing with Virgo. Thicket of thorns, uncertainty. Focus with the cat she. In plain sight with that moon in your chest. Seven of materials. The muse of inspiration. Oh, and the muse of materials. And the black cat, oh, look at that synchronous thing you got going, Virgo. <laughs> you, Virgo, you are gaining some sort of serious confidence. If you've been, if you've been feeling uncertain in any way, if you've been looking at the future with worry, um, if this path has seemed dark rather than light, that is changing. If you haven't known which way to go, what the next action should be, that is changing. Because we have this focus, right? This cat spirit, this mystical, very serious, he's very serious, <laughs> cat here. And you know, with this person in a shroud, this, um, I have this sense of a rebirth, 
that maybe you've been regenerating in some way. That through this summer period, you've been doing some practices, you've been taking care of yourself, you've been taking care of things, you've been learning perhaps new things. But whatever it is you've been doing while in the shroud, you have been very focused about it. And now you are ready to go. Right, you have seen that your guidance is right there with you in your chest, your heart. And also I would say your solar plexus, the will within you can take you past any uncertainty, Virgo. The path is becoming clearer. These roses are becoming visible. This is my path of roses card. The um, I mean, using beauty, using what you love. Uh, right? These Venus energies. Venus is moving through your sign at the moment coming into opposition with Saturn and Pisces. And Saturn is in the place where she is considered to be exalted. So I think they're having a very useful conversation about uh, devotion and discipline and um, certainly having methods around things, you know, not, not doing things all willy-nilly but also with having fun, with uh, being interested in beauty, in those things that you value, that you love, that these are important. They are signposts for you. And you're coming here out of a tunnel and into the light. And then you step into these two muse energies, both the muse of inspiration and materials, wands and pentacles. So that there's a movement into a different landscape. And one where you have enormous confidence, where you know you have the ability to act, to make choices, that you don't have to hang around and wait for stuff. You are not required to wait for some external sign that the, the signal to act will come from within. And that you have power and imagination and stability. And the black cat, right? The echo of the cat, she. Uh, it could be that maybe you've been uh, working with an animal spirit, an animal totem, uh, an actual familiar. And maybe the cats are important to you in some way. Maybe you have cats. But also cats are symbols of independence, of magic, of focus. If you've ever watched a cat uh, preparing to leap on something, of mystery, of magic. They may be, they may be something synchronous for you, perhaps seeing a cat somewhere 
uh, either in person or in imagery will mean something, will be a signal for you, a signpost as well. I think you will know. I don't think you need to need to tell you. Um, I'm also noticing just now, right, there's a moon here in this card and then there's this sunny kind of thing going on here. So that's a, another nod to this full moon that's happening. If you are someone who does ritual, who does magic, it might be useful to do it on the day of the full moon. Last card. Oh. Forgiveness. Hmm. And I'm sort of interested, there's this keyhole, all of these cards have keys and a keyhole. And this keyhole is sitting over, you know, what could be considered this V's heart chakra, solar plexus chakra space. So maybe there is something that you've been forgiving in yourself or somebody else. Maybe it's been, maybe it's something that's been challenging. You know, I don't, I don't think that you can force forgiveness. I don't think you can make yourself or work yourself into forgiveness. I think that forgiveness has to come when you are ready. And, and when it comes, it comes effortlessly. Maybe what you've been doing, and this has worked for me, is to release resentment, which is a little bit, right? It's a little bit easier. It's a little bit less um, all encompassing kind of, you know, we can have this fear that if we forgive someone, that it means it might happen again, or that we are condoning or um, excusing whatever it was that happened, either in someone else or ourselves. And so we don't, right, we don't want to forgive, but we can perhaps release resentment or release acute self-judgment. And then later, right, as the heart really begins to open again, forgiveness opens too. And perhaps this full moon maybe we'll release something for you. That as you release uncertainty, as you gain in confidence, gain in your skills, maybe gain in your ability to see beauty, to embrace beauty, that you will find forgiveness happens more easily. Virgo. Mm -hmm. Deep, deep things, Virgo. Libra. Oh, there's the B again. Prosperity. Hypnos with rest. wash over me. The page of voices. The six of voices. And the muse of voices. All oh, super moon. Libra, there's been this energy of uh, 
of seeing, of understanding things, of epiphanies. And that's continuing here. And I want to say that you, Libra, there, there's also been a couple of energies of people being called out into something. Whereas you seem to have have been or be landing someplace safe. That if you've been feeling uh, at risk, uh, feeling vulnerable, feeling out in the open, feeling under assault in some way, maybe by the energies, uh, you do also have the south node moving through your sign. This energies of releasing things, perhaps, that has felt difficult or just exhausting. And you are coming to rest, like this bee who's going to come to rest. I don't know if you've ever seen those photos sometimes that nature photographers manage to take of bees sleeping in flowers. And you, you are coming, right? You are coming into a space where you can rest, which is interesting. Uh, if you watched my intro, you know that I talked about Ceres, the asteroid Ceres being square the nodes. And also that Cancer is square the nodes as a sign. So there's something oddly for you, Libra, where this moon is not, I think, going to be an activation, but maybe like a cleansing. Because then we have wash over me. So there's something about surrender, about rest, about allowing the energy of this moon to wash over you. Maybe allowing Ceres to take care of you. She is a motherly energy. this, right, this washing over this, you know, like a wave that will pass over you, a wave of energy. And when the wave is passed, you will be able to see much more clearly. much more clearly. <coughs> oh, much more clearly. Ooh. Right, the ability to go where things are leading you, to hear your own wider self speaking to you. You know, maybe your head has been filled with other people's gack. Maybe you've just been really, you know, maybe you've been meeting with a lot of people or something has been happening, Libra, where you've just been inundated with other people's opinions, thoughts, criticisms, emotions, all of their stuff. And that this moon is some sort of right of clearing reset. Because we also have this muse of voices. And this is my third eye crown chakra card. It sits in the king position of the swords air suit. But isn't really a king, right? Is a muse is information arriving, 
is with this, right, with this moon, um, kind of high priestess thing. And then there's this moth butterfly kind of energy happening in the background. That there is information, a download of some kind that is coming in. But it's not going to come until after this clearing takes place. All right, because then we have the super moon, and then there's this color um, referencing happening here. And this is a super moon. It's the first full super moon of the year. I don't, I don't know now if there's three or four, but it may just be also September and October, but not November. I can't remember. Anyway, this is the first full super moon of the year. So some sort of new information, clarity, download. Um, it could be a message coming from somewhere. Maybe somebody's wanted to say something to you or give you something or offer you something. And you haven't been able to see it or receive it. Maybe they've been hesitating because they feel some sort of pushback from your energy. And when this clearing happens, that pushback will go away and they will be able to you know, deliver their message. Last card. Oh, see? Rest. <laughs> We're very serious about that, Libra, apparently. There's even a snail here in the middle. So no rushing about. No overcommitting yourself. Through this moon. I might even go so far as to say through the rest of this month. From now um, until the end of the month, Venus is going to move into your sign. She's going to try and Pluto just before he tips back into Capricorn uh, in the very beginning of September. Or actually, well, yes, he tips back in September. She's going to try and him, I think, on the 28th and 29th of August. So rest. Nurture yourself. Allow this clearing to really move through you and, and kind of be integrated and, um, you know, give your body time, your nervous system time for this energy to clear. I almost see this, right, this giant moon as a kind of protective bubble around you, right? If you're the tree here, Libra. So, you know, keep, keep your energy to yourself and keep other people's at a distance as much as you are able in your life. Oh, Libra. That's exciting, I wonder. I wonder what the message will be. All right, Scorpio. Ah, oh. stag spirit leadership. Hell acceptance. Waiting for the phone to ring. Awakening. Strength. Oh, Scorpio, the tower. And the nightmare. Oh, Scorpio. 
What did we talk about in our last meeting, Scorpio? You accepting the mantle of, of leadership. Did you get this card? I don't know. I'll have to go back and look. Um, it's also here to the, the group reading, if you did not watch the introduction. This was the moon card that came out for the collective. Scorpio. You know, I don't... I kind of want to say this actually isn't you. This is everybody else. This is us, Scorpio. We are waiting for you to call. We are waiting for you to step up in some way, Scorpio. I don't know what it is. I think it's going to be different for everybody. Right? There is this, right, this leadership in this in this transformation that's happening. Um, I don't know, there's just this motorcycle revving its engine just now. Something, right, this acceptance. What the phrase that came to mind was acceptance of godhood, Scorpio. You know, she, ha she has this, right, this necklace of skulls. She is, um, right, this queen of the underworld. I was talking in a different reading, in the Cancer reading, about a retelling of the Persephone myth, where when she eats the pomegranate seeds, she realizes she is powerful. She is queen of the underworld that there is power in this integration, integration of the above and the below. And there's something about that, Scorpio, this, the acceptance of Godhood. And I don't, um, you know, there's, right, there's three major arcana coming out here. So there is, to some extent, a lack of choice. <laughs> um, not a complete lack of choice. You can always, 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 Scorpio, you can always turn away from this if you, don't, if you really don't want it. But I think you're going to find it very difficult to do so. And that maybe even... You, that you'll change your mind. If you've been in strong resistance to taking on this transformational task, this, um, this leadership, right? Because we have this awakening that is judgment, this you know, kind of activation of the heart chakra. Then there's strength strength to do the thing and then there is this incoming Mars in Scorpio Uranus in Taurus electric energy uh, I was saying in the intro that Pallas Athene asteroid palace is moving through your sign opposing Uranus and that opposition is actually going to get stronger. She's at about 23. She's going to move and, and meet up with him more. This will to strategize, to control, to, to put parameters around, to um, contain in some way this Uranian uh, transformation, this Uranian power that's wanting to happen. And then the nightmare. 
this uh, more leadership energy, right? The, the mayor leads the herd of horses. So there's a doubling down on leadership, Scorpio. And let's look at this last card and see. Oh, well that's sort of the soft ending. The keeper of hope. Oh, Scorpio. Oh, there is a tenderness under all of this. You know, in these times of, of what feels like chaos and enormous potential, that it is your, right, your strength your ability to hold these energies, to play with them. You know, I'm seeing this stag. Um, you know, I think it's meant to, you know, that his horns are meant to be, his antlers are meant to be lit up. But here I see his antlers as being made of light. that this is part of the gift, this connection, spiritual connection to source, to magic. To energies of change and composting and, um, and holding discomfort uh, of Mars in Scorpio. Maybe even messages of Eros. You know, I don't know where he is, actually. <laughs> he's not in Scorpio yet. I think he's still moving. He may be in Libra at the moment. I think he is. Uh, I think he's actually about to conjunct the South Node but then he's gonna move into Scorpio. So these energies that we find uncomfortable and embarrassing perhaps. And here there is this release of the birds that you can free people, Scorpio. And it does seem a bit like asking a lot Asking a lot of you, Scorpio. And so maybe, since it seems like asking a lot, can we know just a little bit more about Scorpio's mission? A little extra information for Scorpio, since so much is being asked of them in this moment. Bottom of the deck is Queen of Wands, or I should say top of the deck, then Chariot at the bottom. Ah. <laughs> okay. Hanged Man. Uh -huh. Nine of Swords. Hierophant. So, moving through this, moving through this, right? Moving through it with, right? With the eyes, the ability to see, the ability to live with discomfort, um, the ability to sacrifice what needs to be given, uh, also to, to release, to allow to die that which needs to die. 
And then this hierophant, who's filled with laughter, finding that the spiritual is this, right? The spiritual is this queen of wands. Right, and the chariot as the moon, right? Gem uh, Cancer's sign showing up here. Oh, and next to that I had to look, is the lovers. Scorpio. So teaching people that spirituality is not this deep, dark, horrible, suffering, place right the keeper of hope oh scorpio i hope you're up for it <laughs> i think we need you sagittarius oh beauty hmm Change with werewolf. Oh, how sweet the hum. This is my favorite card. The Knight of Emotions. The Devil. Hmm. The Three of Inspiration. Oh, and the dream weaver, Sagittarius. Well, I'm gonna say that you also have a little bit of a task. Um, Scorpio, I think, has the biggest task. But you seem to be tasked with Presenting the upside of change with, uh, with a kind of leadership, um, but I think one that is more of leading by example. Right? Because we have this beauty, right? Holding that as your touchstone. You know, both this beauty and, or I should say, uh, also how sweet the hum. And then this Knight of Emotions, Knight of Cups, who's about beauty and romance and heart and gifts and the flow of water and inspiration and consciousness. And then we have this rather fearsome image for change. And I think that many people have this idea that change is very, very difficult and that it might be dangerous. You know, mostly when we have, you know, werewolf movies or stories, often that the change that the person undergoes is very painful when they change from the human to the werewolf. that there's pain associated with that movement back and forth. But you wanna point out that this is not necessarily necessary. You are a mutable sign, you are a mutable fire. You're ready to go. Change is bread and butter for you. You're the traveler. And so you want to point out that people don't have to be, right? They don't have to be controlled by their fears, right? They don't have to be controlled by this kind of werewolf thing 
Um, I don't know if you've experienced it. I certainly have. Being in the throes of some emotion and feeling out of control. Right, that's kind of the werewolf story. In most cases that, right, you turn into this wild thing that, that is out of control, uh, that is fearsome. But it is possible for that not to occur. For us to find ways to circulate the energy, to come into better relationship with our own nervous system and our own emotions so that we're not controlled by them. So that we can choose, right? We can choose change. She is choosing to knock over that first domino. To be inspired rather than afraid. Uh, I'm a Terry Pratchett fan. You may have heard me talk about his books and characters. And in his stories, there are werewolves. Um, but they, they maintain, you know, a lot of their human awareness when they're in wolf form. And they become, you know, wolf, like wolves, not not this sort of wolf man thing, but actual wolves uh, with a heightened, really heightened sense of smell. And so they have this, uh, this ability, right, to move in multiple spaces. As I think do you, Sagittarius. I think you can move in multiple spaces. And you know, Jupiter right now, specifically, is in Gemini. And that is Mercury's space. And Mercury is a psychopomp. Mercury really goes everywhere, Mercury and Hermes, in their stories. And actually, I have talked about the Persephone myth a couple of times. And in the story, it is Hermes slash Mercury who goes to the underworld in order to negotiate with Hades so that Persephone is allowed to come and see her mother, right, spring and summer, and then she goes back to the underworld. So there's, currently, there is extra ability for you to move in various spaces and maybe to, maybe you're encountering people. There has been talk in various of the readings about meeting up with specific people and maybe you're encountering somebody who really needs this guidance around change and the ability to change. Because we do also have this Dream Weaver card. And this is feeling like you helping someone with their dream. Helping someone to revive a dream I think that in the process, a dream of yours may be revived as well. Everything you do for others, you also do for yourself and vice versa. Right? Holding this energy, this sweet hum of summer, right? Like that moment when you hear the hum of the cicadas and you feel the sun, that moment, Sagittarius. So your last card, oh, is the keeper of love. So good. Because there is love here. I mean, if there is somebody specific that this is talking about, this may be somebody for whom you feel a deep love, a friend, a family member, a lover, a child. And you're going to show them the way. 
And maybe not, you know, through telling them stuff, but through your example of how you move through this very intense space that we're moving through now. Sagittarius, inspirational. Capricorn. The wise woman of the grove with grace. The dragon with treasure. The herbalist. Eight of inspiration. I wondered if it would come out somewhere. The ten of emotions. Death. And the moon dancer. Well, Capricorn. You are discovering something, a power that you didn't know you had. I think you really didn't know you had it. And I think it is, it is a healing power for yourself and for others. I also think that you've been searching, searching for something in your life. Maybe searching for an inspiration or, you know, a new direction in your life. Perhaps, I don't know, but you've been wandering around this forest. And for a long time, there's been nothing. You've just been encountering a lot of shadows. Um, I mean, you've met some interesting characters along the way that you've spoken to and, and learnings and experiences, but you haven't found the thing. And then you kind of come around a bush or a tree and then there in the middle of the path is this glowing gem and this spirit this spirit of grace. So that this isn't, you know, all of, all right, all of the experiences, all of the wisdom, all of the mistakes, all of the learnings are important, but this is a moment of grace, of a thing kind of happening without any direct action from you. There is no direct cause and effect. And, you know, initially, it, it appears sort of nice and sweet and soft and gentle. But then, when you spend a little time with it, you realize you realize what you've actually found encountered in the forest is this dragon treasure. And with this herbalist coming, that it is, that it is some gift or power that you have that is meant for healing, right? To, to assist people or perhaps actually assist the environment. It could be that too. Um, 
I think, you know, it might be across the board on, in a very kind of practical, mundane world sense. It could be that you realize that you have a real gift for, you know, turning companies around, for helping companies that are struggling in some way, who have some kind of internal problem. You know, maybe they have a culture of blame or, you know, of lack or, right? Stuff's going on that is blocking the company's ability to do what it's supposed to do. You might even be a kind of healer of healers with this grace dragon energy. That you might be somebody that other healer type people come to, like, you know, therapists who have other therapists as clients. And then we have the Eight of Inspiration, the Eight of Wands. This card has been coming out everywhere. <laughs> this is the energy now. And whatever, however this power, whatever this power is, this gift that you didn't know you had, This is an expression of it. So that you can get together with other people in some way, either, either as a facilitator or a, you know, a consultant or something, or maybe just as a member of a group in order to channel this energy that is coming in now and channel it into something beautiful something that is not chaotic, something that is fulfilling for the whole group. And you know, this might be on a really large scale. I don't know who all is coming to this reading. This could even be right on a political level or a kind of a large community level. where there is a real channeling of this energy. And then of course death, right? The transformation. There's also a sense of coming out here that you're gonna reveal yourself as this person. And that could be in a mundane way, right? You, you start a business, you, you know, put yourself out there as a consultant or a therapist or whatever. Or, a, you know, I don't know, you start a YouTube channel. Or it could be on a more energetic level. That you start walking around like this. That you let this energy really go that you let it guide you into the spaces where this is happening. Also, um, on a logistical level, on September 4th, Pluto moves back into your sign for just about two and a half months till November 19th. So there's a last touch of the Lord of the Underworld uh, coming through your sign. Perhaps the last thing to learn, understand, receive before you embark on this new, uh, this new journey that you have, this new life, I want to say, right? And look at you. How excited are you? And if you haven't been looking for this thing, if you've been wandering around in this forest just forever, you are gonna feel like this. There's also here, right, the skill, the skill of the dancer. 
last card. Oh, of course. Become. Become Capricorn. I think that speaks for itself. Hmm. Oh, Capricorn. Aquarius. I was wondering what this was going to be. Oh, reflecting pool, stillness. The mermaid with beauty. Listen. This came out in the collective reading. The star, look at you. <laughs> Coming out as yourself. And the fool. Ah, and the four of inspiration. And the stargazer. <laughs> Aquarius. Well, clearly. You are happening. I mean, first of all, these two things together. So there is this sense of stillness. And I think that there may be like a, a feeling of a breath held as this full moon happens for you. Um, there is a sense, you know, that the full moon is a three day event because it, it looks pretty close to full, both the day before and the day after. I mean, you know, depending on, on exact times, but there's, there's kind of a sense of that of a three day period, just as the, the solstice has that feeling, right? These peak moments. So there is this, right? This moment of stillness. And also it feels like taking in a breath before the plunge. into a new reality, into a new world, into a place where, you know, where beauty is significant. Um, You know, that I've brought up the Persephone myth several times and I'm going to bring it up again. Maybe I'll have to do a whole collective reading on it. I don't know. But we don't associate the planet Pluto with beauty. But I would argue that we should. Because Pluto, Hades, he takes per Proserpina, Persephone, to be his queen because he ench is enchanted by her beauty, by herself. I think that Pluto is concerned with beauty, just as he is con um, concerned with the right use of power, with appropriate revelation. With transformation. Right? Our, our usual symbol of transformation is the butterfly, which is out here in the Aries reading. Right? Beauty. I think, I think that beauty is something that is deeply, deeply important. 
I think we ignore it at our peril or we trivialize it. But I think that it is going to be deeply important in the next coming 20 years as Pluto moves through Aquarius. And so I think you are going to be at the forefront of that, of keeping an eye on the beauty, of holding it. I want to say, you know, Aquarius is often seen as the right as the sign of the innovator or the sign of technology. There's a lot of talk of AI and how that's all and the internet and how that's all going to work as Pluto moves through. And I think that keeping beauty, like real beauty, not superficial beauty, not simplistic or reductionist beauty, is going to be really important. Also, listening. I think listening is going to be deeply important for all of us. Really listening, not just waiting to talk, which I've certainly done on plenty of occasions. It's a skill to cultivate really listening. And then the star, right? This is also a beautiful energy, this energy that calls to us. that does have romance and longing and uh, the calling to the heart and the soul and the spirit and, and the mind. You know that you are the, the, the water bearer. You carry this energy of consciousness and heart within you. And then here, moving forward, the fool, moving forward um, with, with passion, with joy, uh, with a sense of wonder, right? We have this keeper of wonder come through in the, in the collective part of this reading, in the introduction. And then also with this floor of inspiration, working together with others, with other people and with, and with source. The, the beautiful community. And so we have the stargazer. And actually here with you reaching out to touch the moon. Right? To, to, to really experience the water, to touch that moon energy. I think Aquarius that you are going to be challenged in ways that has not happened before, as of course signs are uh, when Pluto passes through them. And you have a long time, 20 years, to experience this, to grow, to expand, to transform, maybe over and over in many different ways. Hmm. Solitude. So keeping your own counsel, Aquarius, the, the kind of apotheosis, the most uh, gorgeous vision of Aquarius is of the individual within the group. The ability to balance, right? The balance, the needs of the individual, the, the needs for expression, the needs for love, the needs for uh, material things with the needs of the whole group. Now in the past, 
right? Starting way, way back in the mists, even before history, even before anybody started writing anything down, we kind of began leaning on law, right? As a way to do that. Rules and regulations, laws to protect. Sometimes to protect the group and sometimes to protect the individual. But in, right, in a more ideal way, it would be kind of self-regulating, right? That a group would feel that the, all the members of a group would be confident, that they would know they don't have to be afraid if they want to express something differently. You know, that if they do it in integrity, if they do it with respect, if they do it with kindness to others, that there is nothing to fear. And this is a beauty of Aquarius. And then the flip side is the Borg. Right? The assimilation. Uh, Groupthink. Everybody thinking the same way so that that's how we stay safe. Right? And everybody believes exactly the same thing and does the same thing and um, believes the same things and says the same things. Then will be safe. And so you want to keep your own counsel, Aquarius. Certainly remain, remaining in integrity, uh, remaining part of the group. Um, the idea of kith and kin has also come out in several of the readings. but also keeping your own counsel, right? That, that Aquarius-Leo axis. And the sun is conjunct both Mercury and Vesta at the time of this moon. So there is, right, there is a flame to tend at your own heart. Aquarius. All right, Pisces. Freedom. Oh, the harpy with chaos. <laughs> Edelweiss. The five of voices. I see where we're going. The ten of inspiration. The nine of inspiration. And the new moon. Oh, Pisces. You know, Saturn is moving through your sign and he is here. The, the idea of freedom and creative energy, right? The creative energy of chaos in a container. And I don't want to say in containment, because that's what it implies, like a cage or a full box or something. This is more like a bowl. Or a platform that creates stability, that creates a space. I mean, maybe even like a stage. Right, a stage is a container where a performance occurs. You know, and it can be anything from, you know, a very formal stage with a proscenium that creates kind of this fourth wall that is the audience. 
or it could be a kind of in the round arrangement where the audience, you know, can kind of become part of the performance. So this kind of a container, right, holding space, Pisces, you know, and you have that power to hold space. Um, there is a connection that is now formed in my mind between Cancer, Scorpio, and um, Pisces. Um, Cancer with a kind of high priestess, um, you know, maybe the leader of a ritual, perhaps. Um, Scorpio taking on the responsibility to assist in change and transformation. And then you kind of as the space, this watery, lush um, consciousness space. You know, maybe where this is all happening, you know, right, like, in, in the collective consciousness space, not in this physical world. And so we have Edelweiss. And to me, this always feels hermity, like the hermit, because she's walking around with a lantern. But she actually, rather than really using that star lantern as her guide, she is focused on the moon. So a hermit who is heart-based, moon-based, and the moon is your card in the tarot, Pisces. So this is that Virgo-Pisces axis, and we're moving to that. Um, the next full moon that is, an, that is an eclipse is the full moon in Pisces happening uh, in September, in mid-September. And then the North Node will move into Pisces uh, on January 25th, So the five of voices right here with the olive branch. Bringing people together, bringing uh, disparate voices, disparate ideas together in that common Pisces space. You know, Aquarius, I was saying, is the individual within the group. And Pisces is really, right, is the group without borders. Right, so embracing people, not even, like not even being concerned with what they might believe or not believe. What their circumstances are. But, right, joining everybody up. And then with this ten of inspiration, this feels like filling all the cups. You know, sort of pouring water everywhere. Um, being, being inspirational. And, you know, this is not in any way, even though this is the Ten of Inspiration, Ten of Wands, which can have an efforting idea. This is not actually effortful. This is just what happens. Pisces, when you move from this energy, this, I almost want to say explosive, but really it's like, um,
you know, it's sort of the energy of the heart or, or the energy of viriditas, the life force. When you allow the life force to surge through your waters, then this filling of everybody else's cup just happens. There is no efforting on your part, right? You are kind of just, you know, being this, being yourself. And then we have this new moon. This flip side of the full moon. And here looking very eclipsy, um, the new moon eclipse is uh, the new moon in Libra on October 2nd, I think, which is sort of interesting when it's a two. Um, there may be something in that for you. There's been a little bit of kind of specific messaging sprinkled throughout here. Um, individual people who are met, individual time periods, specific practices, and yours may be that there may be something about that new moon on October 2nd, uh, as opposed to the Virgo new moon in September, which is also sort of, I mean, it may be that there's something about both of those, right? Because the Virgo new moon happens across from you. Uh, it could also be that new moon energy is especially potent for you. That if you are someone who engages in ritual or in other kinds of moon related practices, that there is something at the new moon. Uh, I was saying in a different reading, and now I've forgotten which, that there is this astrological technique of seeing from new moon to first quarter to full moon to last quarter, and it's nine months between. So there's a new moon that happens at X degrees of a sign. Nine months later, there will be a first quarter at about that same degree in that sign. And then there'll be a full moon nine months after that. And then a last quarter moon nine months after that. So it's a 27 month period where, right, where something is occurring. So it could be that, you know, some some cycle will begin for you at the next new moon or the October new moon. Or you might also look back at the new moon in Aquarius in uh, mid-February of 2023 and see if something began for you then. I don't know, Pisces. That, I think, is going to be different for everybody. And your last card. Oh, I enjoy this card. So it's got beetles on it. Create. So there is, right, there is this sense of creativity coming through here, Pisces, right, with this idea of the stage, of a performance. And, you know, in some sort of tribal traditions, Right, there is this idea of a performance like being a microcosm. Right, that something that is in, right, that is performed kind of becomes real. So in terms perhaps of, of manifestation or of creation of something, um, they may be creating a piece of art or a story that you write, or you know, a play that you write or perform, will become real. I don't know exactly, Pisces, how this is going to play out for you, 
Um, I'm sort of hoping that the readings as we move from here, the longer readings, maybe will fill out some of this for us and for you. So there is something creational here. And it may be that this, right, this olive branch, this um, peacemaking, this peace creation is a byproduct of this creation. You know, kind of it's something you write or create a piece of art or a play that you write inspires people to come together in some way. But you follow, you follow whatever your moon is, Pisces. I wish you the very, very best. And I'll see you in the next Pisces reading. So long.